Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. Uh, so my colleague in the Department of History of Art, Alex Nagel, and I have organized this event with FIT's Diversity Collective to encourage equity, inclusion, and diversity, and to celebrate women and the contribution of women for Women's History Month. Uh, this event is also part of the Bridging Time discussion series. And the goal of this series is to invite speakers to talk about the different ways that we can connect the past to the present and to encourage our audience to think about the ways our past shapes us today and vice versa. So in these discussions, we find ancient parallels to modern issues and think about what these parallels may tell us about our shared human experience. Uh, this is also a forum to think about how current and modern biases may have prevented us from understanding our past in an effective way. Um, so that's what we're doing today with Mean Girls, thinking about women in ancient Egypt and Western Asia. So Mean Girls is a term that is used to describe um, female social cliques, uh, particularly in secondary school education in the US, and it's a very loaded term. Um, it's basically an infantilizing way of calling someone a nasty woman. Um, and both these terms reflect the sexism and misogyny that women from all walks of life face today and have faced in the past. Um, and it's a type of sexism and misogyny that has also resulted in misunderstandings of the roles and status of women in the ancient world. So today we're inviting two specialists, Anne Macy Roth and Magdalene Dajani, to, debu to debunk some of these misconceptions and to put ancient women in the spotlight. Um, so each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes and there will be a question and answer period after both speakers have presented their topics. And you're welcome to use the chat feature to type in your questions, which we will then um, read aloud to the speakers. Uh, so Alex Nagel, who is a specialist in ancient Western Asia and an assistant professor and assistant chair in the history of art department here at FIT, as well as chair of the art history and museum professions program well introduce our first speaker thank you thank you very much jen and i just realized i'm the only man here today this afternoon for the next 45 minutes so i'm gonna thank you so try my best from the other side so i'm also very grateful for jen uh, to Anne and Marjolin for being here this afternoon i want to briefly introduce Marjolin, our first speaker who is actually currently in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a Chester Dale Fellow in the Ancient Near East Department. And she comes with a master from Columbia University, is currently pursuing her, another degree in San Jose um, uh, University, State University, and has also worked at the Morgan Library here in New York City, in particular on a small um, group, on a, on a not so large scale, type of um, monuments. And so, Marjolin, I'm giving it to you to introduce the mean girls of the uh, Western Asian side. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and inviting me for today's event. I'm about to share my screen. And is everyone seeing this? Perfect. Great. Um, so just to orient us where we are, Western Asia is um, coincides with what is today known as the modern Middle East, unfortunately, but um, so this is where we are. Uh, Turkey is here, the Levant, so Palestine, Israel, Syria, Jordan here, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Iran further east. All right, so going over to women. Women are were a vital and vibrant part of ancient Western Asian society. In art and in texts, women are represented undertaking a multitude of different roles and professions, such as, but not limited to, priestesses, innkeepers, wet nurses, scribes, textile workers, as well as landowners. On this shell inlay found in Nippur, modern day Iraq, a woman plays a flute, which we can see here, and her hands are over it. Um, so she is a musician, but not only is her flute represented, but attached to her bracelet is a cylinder seal, which is a type of object used to authenticate documents pertaining to legal and economic matters by rolling the seal across clay tablets. So on the right, you see a clay tablet um, that had to deal with the distribution of barley. 
Um, and right here, you can see the impression of a dog, just this tail right there. So at one point, a cylinder seal was rolled across this tablet while the clay was still soft and wet. And to secure containers and doorways against tampering, seals were impressed onto soft chunks of clay. The surfaces of these seals were carved in the negative with various scenes and sometimes inscriptions that named the owner. It was a marker of identity, a signature. Depending on the material the seal was made from and the imagery carved onto it, the object could also take on a protective function and be worn as an amulet. As an object that many people, including women across this region and throughout several millennia owned, it's interesting to think about what this type of object meant to them and how important it was in their lives to have it incised here on this shell inlay. Women owned cylinder seals and seal images also depicted women, even some of the earliest ones. Dated about a millennium earlier, then actually just a couple of hundred years earlier um, than the shell inlay is a specific group of seals that have been found in several regions across Western Asia and show human figures performing particular tasks. These figures are most commonly interpreted as women engaged in agricultural work or the production of food, pottery, or textiles, material needed for everyday life. This limestone seal also excavated from Nippur features two pairs of figures facing each other. So there's one here and there's another pair here. And their hair is swept back and their arms reaching towards what may be an abstract representation of pots here and here. It is possible this signifies churning, for example, churning milk into butter. And these thin marks down below may indicate that they're sitting on cushions or some sort of mats. Here, a group of women are manufacturing textiles. Two of them are operating a loom or a warping board, right here. And the third is holding the material that is going to be woven. woven excuse me. The specialization of crafts and labor took place within the same period that these seals were created, which also coincided with the rise of cities, complex administrative structures, and the invention of writing. The products of activities, um, the products of the activities rendered on these seals likely had an impact beyond the context of daily life. Later texts illustrate the importance of textiles in the economy, for instance. These seals aren't just interesting because of the images and the work the women are engaging in, um, but also because of the terminology that scholars ascribe to them. For many years, they were, and frankly, still are known and described as the pigtailed ladies, the pigtailed figures, pigtailed women. Squatting is also a term that has been associated with these figures to account for how they are seated and the position of their bodies. Moreover, their work, or the place in which it is being done is sometimes designated domestic. This language is not necessarily accurate. Although today pigtails most commonly refer to hairstyles in which the hair is symmetrically divided into two braided or unbraided portions affixed to each side of the head, the way it was initially meant in relation to the images was gathering the hair into one section and braiding or tying it to the back of the head. The figure's hair is kept away from the face, but it could be secured by other means like a headband or a net. This actually might be the type of hairstyle that is being rendered here in the seals in a schematic fashion. Looking carefully at these images, it is also difficult to discern the manner in which the figures are seated because their bodies were rendered with drills. And that's why we're seeing these circular shapes here on the seal. That's what created them, is this technique of the drill um, to carve the stone. So the specific position of their legs is not always clear, at least to us. Um, it might not have been obscured to people living in the past um, at that time. Secondly, these terms more specifically continuing to use them to label and define figures thought to be women diminishes their visibility, roles, and value, as well as that of the material they produced within our understanding of ancient society, in part because of biases and assumptions long present in our own society. 
pigtails are associated with young girls, not industries or professional or and specialized skills or mature women. Beyond its inaccuracy, I haven't quite narrowed down the exact reason as to why squatting is denigrating and that's something that we can discuss later if anyone expresses that interest in the chat. Um, though I should note that the word squatting is mostly applied to this group of seals, but some exceptions include monkeys, small human figures, demons, um, and that sort of became clear to me when browsing the Morgan Library's collection of seals on their online um, database, as well as the over 8,000 modern impressions that they have for study. So a modern impression like this. Um, so let's consider for a moment the different language that's employed for an image illustrating men working. The men rendered in this scene are described as leather craftsmen operating in two rooms. And this man on the right is described as kneeling or seated, not as squatting. So they're given a profession and a context not characterized as domestic. Also, the figures are not primarily defined by their physical traits, whereas the women we've been discussing have for decades not received the same treatment. And even if products were manufactured in a domestic setting, that doesn't mean they had no impact beyond the home or on the economy or that their production process demanded any less skill. So if its use here is problematic, how was a term like pigtailed not only introduced in relation to these images, but perpetuated to the present day? Although it might have been established earlier, it seems from various publications on cylinder seals that the terminology became prominent in the 1930s. During the earlier part of the decade, pigtailed was assigned to these figures, but their gender wasn't explicitly identified. In 1939, however, Henry Frankfurt called them pigtailed women and proposed that they are squatting in his publication titled Cylinder Seals, a documentary essay on the art and religion of the ancient Near East, which is what this area and this field um, used to be called, is still being called, and hopefully is under review at different institutions, academic and non-academic. So initially these words might not have meant to be disparaging, they might not have been intended that way, but the terminology for this subject didn't evolve as the interpretations of the seals developed and as language itself transformed. Instead, it was repeated and reinforced over and over for almost 90 years. And its usage continues in the present day, even as it's being questioned. Several museums still utilize the term pigtailed in their online collections, catalogs, and labels as it is incorporated into the titles that these cylinder seals are given, um, which is what you're seeing right now with the METS collection online for this object. At some institutions, like this one, the term is enclosed with quotations, questioning its validity. However, I do want to note, and on a positive note, it's beginning to be phased out in favor of options that are more appropriate for the scenes and the activities depicted. Working women is one of those options. And my hope is that this continues and the language keeps on being evaluated and updated accordingly. My point here is that terminology and language matters, which brings me to the title of this event, which Jen explained so beautifully and while I do and can appreciate the reference to the well-known movie, a cult classic that many enjoy in good fun and as a means for thinking about and prompting a discussion on the effect that stereotypes, misconceptions, and biases have had on the study of women in the ancient past, I do want to push us and challenge us to come up with ways of doing this in the near future without reusing and recentering those stereotypes since they are, as Jen explained again, based in misogynistic and stereotypes typical values. Um, so yeah, but rather I would like us to think about ways that we can honor women and their experiences as the archaeological, art historical, and textual evidence reflects it. So thank you so much. Um, and I really enjoyed this and I really look forward to your questions and our discussion. Alex, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so very much, Marceline. This was a fantastic um, uh, yeah, start. So I'm going to give over to Jen, who will introduce our second speaker. 
Thank you so much, Alex. Um, so our next speaker is Anne Macy Roth, um, who received her doctorate from the University of Chicago in 1985 and held positions at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the University of California, Berkeley, and Howard University. Um, she's currently teaching in departments of art history and of Hebrew and Judaic studies at New York University um, and is currently writing a book at the moment called Reversing the Ordinary Practices Ancient Egyptian Conceptions of Gender and Fertility. Uh, so thank you, Anne. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Sorry, my screen just blinked out <laughs> that I meant to be reading from. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, let's see if this works. Window, where is my screen? Help. Um, and share screen, share screen. Select window or screen is not giving me my entire screen. The only screen I have open is this. Okay, we practiced this, it worked. And you can't see this, I'm assuming. No. Okay, we shut this again, lock. Can't share my screen. Okay, now let's see if I can share my screen again. That I have this open. It is open. Oh, I don't want to do that, but I want to do this. Sorry. A window. Dismiss. I must grant permission somehow to screen share. Present now. I seem to have made it impossible to share my screen by closing it. I can possibly share. And can you that's force, right. I guess, if you want to. I don't, um, uh, this is taking tons of time and I don't mean to do that. Okay, we had me, it working. I don't know why it didn't work. It's never, it's never perfect. It's always got to create, well, let, let's hope that it'll work for me too. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I will, and in the meantime, I just want to say that we keep questions also for um, both speakers until after the presentation by Anne. So um, that uh, I'm sure for Mastolin also, um, there are some comments, questions. Um, and I want to congratulate, by the way, it's Women's Month, of, of course, and today is uh, Mother's Day in the Arab world. So um, congratulate all the mothers that are in the audience here. Monday, Monday, Monday. it's coming. Oh. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Okay, so you guys can see my slide and I'll give you a, a hint, um, Jennifer, to, as in next slide, please, okay. which I hope doesn't come off my 10 minutes nor this mess because it's going to be longer than 10 minutes, I'm afraid, <laughs> if that happens. Um, okay, so I wanted to thank you very much for introducing me and for inviting me to this, to give this presentation and to talk to all you people um, about women in ancient Egypt. Um, the subject of women in ancient Egypt, sec second slide please, um, the subject of an, an, women in ancient Egypt, since it began to be in, addressed in the early 1970s, has always been a little triumphalist. It tends to celebrate the evidence that ancient Egyptian women did all sorts of jobs and had all sorts of rights and freedoms, exceeding those of women in ancient Mediterranean societies otherwise. Presentations on this topic often begin with this lady, who is Queen Hatshepsut. You see her at right being crowned as king of Egypt, the pharaoh, wearing not only the dress, but the body of the man. Early 20th century Egyptologists very much viewed Hatshepsut as a mean girl in the condescending sense of the world word um, that has been talked about. Um, after all, she took the throne away from a young boy and refused to give it up even when her stepson has reached his mid-20s. Never mind that once you've been an anointed as a divine ruler, as a god, it's sort of different, difficult to go back to being a normal person again. Early male scholars also resented Hatshepsut's scandalous decision to be represented as a man, complaining that she was trying to deceive her subjects. Uh, but given that she called herself the daughter of the sun god and that her name, Hatshepsut, actually means foremost of noble women, I really doubt that the population was that much deceived. Next. Hatshepsut was not the only woman who ruled Egypt as king. 
Um, this is an impressive argument for Egyptian women's extensive rights and autonomy, but it's far from the only one. And as you can see from this list, I do want to stress though what I say at the bottom, which is that ancient Egypt was actually definitively a patriarchal society. Men had almost all of the power. Most women worked at home, raising children, cooking food, and weaving and sewing clothing. Despite exceptions like Hatshepsut, men held almost total power in the political, administrative, economic, and religious realms, and almost all the literature, art, and architecture we have was created by men. My interest in this subject has, oh, sorry, next slide. Uh, my interest in this subject has generally been in explaining um, the underlying reason for what I see as a contradiction, that is unusual levels of female autonomy and agency, despite the all-powerful patriarchal system socially. And I see, I think I've found part of the answer in the work of the Greek historian Herodotus. In his histories, Herodotus stressed that everything in Egypt is backwards. He begins with the agricultural system in which the fields are watered not by rain, but by the annual flooding of the Nile. He then goes on to list the reversals he finds in ancient Egyptian society, most of which are reversed social roles of men and women, even though many of these reversals are wrong or unlikely. Um, but they point in general to his impression that ancient Egyptian gender roles were backwards from those he knew in Greece. And that impression is really important because unlike us, Herodotus was actually able to visit ancient Egypt. Next slide, please. And I just, oh, yes. Um, this odd reversal of gender roles may actually derive from Egypt's agricultural cycle and the views of fertility that it led to. In Greece, and indeed in most of the rest of the world, life-giving waters equated with masculine semen fall from the sky as rain impregnating the fertile, passive Mother Earth lying below. In Egypt, those waters come up as floodwaters, arising from the Earth itself, which is therefore seen as male. It's identified as the Earth god Geb, who was responsible for both fertility and fertilization. This explains, by the way, why one of the most commonly mentioned mechanisms for the creation of the world in Egyptian myths is masturbation. Geb's wife, the sky goddess Newt, who you see in this picture, is left nothing to do but stretch out naked above him and stimulate his creation with her beauty. She stimulates him and he creates new life, reversing the conventional rules of the genders. As a result, the Egyptians developed a system of gender relations that was counterintuitive to most non-Egyptians, and that includes, I think, most Western scholars. I'd like to finish by giving you two examples of ways in which the ancient Egyptians reverse our expectations about gender roles. Next, please. The first example is a textual example from a story called The Tale of Two Brothers. At one point in the story, the wife of the elder brother tries to seduce the younger brother when he comes in from the fields to get seed. He emphatically turns her down, but after he leaves, she worries that he'll tell his brother. So she makes up a convincing lie claiming that he tries to seduce, he tried to seduce her. She truly is a mean girl. She's really not a very nice person at all, in fact. This gives us two accounts of a failed seduction. Uh, first, how a woman tries to seduce a man, and then in her own lie, it tells us how a man tries to seduce a woman. And I think their differences are very revealing. And you see them here. When the wife tries to seduce her brother-in-law, she first compliments his strength, so big and strong. Then she puts her arms around him, touching him and embracing him. And finally, she offers to make him beautiful clothing if he'll sleep with her. In contrast to the true story, the wife's account, uh, her convincing lie, uh, prevents a very different mode of selection. The man does not compliment the woman or touch her. He merely proposes that they have sex together, using exactly the same words that she had used. Then he asks her to loosen her braids because loosened hair is seen to be sexually alluring. I always think of the librarian taking down her, of her bun and shaking her curls loose in the old movies and becoming a, a beauty. Then when she turns him down, he becomes angry and beats her. The woman clearly is assumed to be more interested in having sex in this story. The man she wants must be wooed with compliments embraces and the promise of new clothing. But if the man proposes sex, 
it's still her job to seduce him by loosening her hair. He offers her nothing, but he assumes that she will agree, and he becomes angry when she doesn't. This story recalls another story where a young wife similarly gives a man a chest full of clothing, along with an invitation to meet her in the summer house for sex, pretty explicitly. These two stories are the only clear examples we have of anyone paying for sex in ancient Egyptian texts before the Greco-Roman period. They call prostitution the oldest profession, but in Pharaonic Egypt, it seems to have been practiced by men and not by women, a result of women's greater desire for sex. Next one. The second example I want to show you is a work of Egyptian art, a painting on papyrus dating from just about the same period as the story, the 13th or maybe the 12th century BCE. It's a bit battered, but the fragments have been carefully reconstructed. It's divided into two halves. On its next one, please. On its right half, the papyrus gives us a beautifully drawn picture of animals, lots of pictures of animals uh, direct, acting like humans, often in topsy-turvy ways. Here, for example, we have a musical group, a donkey, a lion, a crocodile, and a monkey. The left half of the papyrus, in contrast, is extremely pornographic, as will be my final two slides, so you have been warned. Next one, please, with roll of drums. Here you see two of the 12 couples depicted in this leftmost section. There's been a lot written about this papyrus, of course, usually focusing on the pornographic pornographic part. It's often claimed that it depicts a brothel with customers cavorting with the prostitutes, even as scholars that like to concentrate on the aesthetics and the structure of the papyrus suggest that the erotic scenes were likely titillating and even arousing to the male viewer. The key to the papyrus, however, lies in Alexandra von Lieven's observations, I think. She relates the scenes, um, she relates the scenes to the goddess of love, Hathor, who was the principal goddess of where it was found. She makes a very convincing argument that the men shown are the bald ones of Hathor, which are kind of working class, low level priests who serve the goddess and who also like to party very clearly. Hathor is one of a group of goddesses that can be very bloodthirsty and difficult, by the way. Uh, again, re to refer to the Mean Girls theme, which I took literally rather than as a critique. Um, when she is in a violent mood, she must be soothed with moral animal stories that are rather like a Aesop's fables, and also um, the stimulation of wine, music, and sex. Von Lieven argues that the animal stories here um, were acted out as part of the annual Hathor festival, and afterwards there was a wildly drunken orgy. She believes that the papyrus is a depiction of what occurred during one occasion of that festival. Next slide, please. I have a slightly different interpretation. Egyptian artists almost never recorded actual events, certainly not without some religious purpose, and based on the quality and arrangement of these images, this is no casual sketch. In addition, a recent retranslation of the text surrounding the couples on this papyrus points out that it's the woman who is speaking in all but a few of them, and that she speaks in an elevated and literary language. Moreover, in some scenes, she, um, like the ones you see here, she actually seems to be controlling the action, which the translators feel is peculiar for a common prostitute. And as I've just explained, I don't believe there were prostitutes at all. So that would also be an argument against that interpretation. I would argue that instead, the papyrus actually represents the goddess Hathor herself, not a prostitute. She is both larger and more beautiful than her partners, and she has a magic lotus flower floating above her head. It makes more sense then to see it as a votive offering, a gift to the goddess, illustrating her favorite moral tales, and then depicting her taking her sexual pleasure with her own favorite bald ones. And if the Egyptians thought a goddess would enjoy an offering of pornographic images, might not this suggest that, an ancient, that ancient Egyptian women, more generally, the wives of the artists perhaps, also enjoyed looking at dirty pictures? So amongst the other reversals, I would argue that ancient Egyptian women did not sell their bodies as prostitutes, but instead sometimes paid men for sex. Moreover, they enjoyed looking at pornography, possibly more than their husbands did. And I would argue that Western scholars, not having that sort of thing in their cultures, have therefore 
ignored the evidence for these two predilections of ancient Egyptian women. But the aggressiveness that they show, are sh um, show in initiating sex and being the sort of stimulating the thing that starts everything up, um, I would argue, explains why Egyptian women behaved in ways that seem extremely independent and liberated to modern reviewers, uh, modern viewers, even in the context of what is, in fact, a patriarchal society and power structure. Thank you very much for your attention. Wow. And this is, this is fantastic. <laughs> so, I mean, I had not seen um, your also images uh, before. I have actually lots of questions, but I want to leave it first to Jen also, and maybe uh, our audience um, who have, have questions. Jen, do you want to start, maybe? Um, <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. She clears her throat. <laughs> they weren't that obscene, were they? I don't know. No, no, no. I mean, as as Anne knows, I am I'm a big fan of that papyrus, but I study the the animal side. I, I find it very interesting that I I looked at it from the totally opposite end of the papyrus, yet we came to the same conclusions, <laughs> um, which is essentially that these are probably gifts to Hathor. Um, I um, I remember the first time you had uh, were looking at it and you were concerned that perhaps you were coming up with an idea that contradicted with mine and and we could relax because that didn't have to happen, I guess. Um, but uh, I actually, so I, I, I really appreciated um, both of you talking today, by the way. Um, Majeline, you brought up, you know, images I personally have never seen before um, because this is, you know, I'm an Egyptologist um, and so I never heard of these so-called um, pigtail girls and, and I think you bring up a really good point about, you know, the renaming of, of, of things too um, and, and how, you know, ideas can be framed in these institutions because it's, it's people's first, you know, um, introduction oftentimes to these topics. Um, I was wondering, on a practical level, because I know you're working at the Metropolitan, and I, I had a fellowship at the Metropolitan as well, um, and have worked in museums, what do you think is the best way to start making those changes? Because I feel like it's often very hard to start making these changes for these very large institutions where um, you know they're thinking about the cost of replacing labels for instance like things like that yeah thank you so much for that question it's a great one um well the met doesn't have to worry too much because the um galleries in the department that i'm in they they're called the ancient near eastern galleries they're actually going to be renovated very soon um, and so the collection will, will end up being deinstalled later this year. So if anyone hasn't gone through there and, and taken a look, um, so that I'm sure the terminology will be updated there. As for catalogs, I'm not sure, like for the collection online, who is responsible for that and how, how, you know, how they want to tackle, um, that, um, I know at the Morgan, um, there were there's a group of us like there were systems librarians and then everyone in there was like at least one re one representative of various different departments who were taking part in this we called it critical critical cataloging um and so we went through that process to carefully look at what was in the collections and how they were described and um figure out how to how to change the language and update it um, more appropriately. Um, so basically, at the Morgan, I took out pigtailed. I mean, we we preserved the old titles so that people could still search them, so that people still know it's there and that it happened. Because we can't pretend like it didn't happen. But um, for the main, for the main, you know, title, those are not pigtailed and squatting are not there anymore. Um, so that's that's sort of how that happened. Um, so yeah. so, but it's still like 
I guess hashtagged it, 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 like so you could still do a search, but that's not part of the main. That's not part um, of the main yeah. title. It's not part of the subject heading. So if you go Project. lower on on their on their website, they have subject headings that you can click on, and it'll collate all those um, with the same subject. Um, it's not that anymore. It just is under variant title, so oh, that you I can see. see what the title was before. And anything that showed up in old catalogs that's quoted, we made sure that those are quoted so that people know that they're from a print catalog, that those are the words of a print catalog. Um, I hope that that's very helps. important work. Yeah, 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 that's really great work. Um, I imagine a lot of work too. It sounds like an amazing project as my colleague Lisa Haney is saying in the chat, who is doing, um, also a lot of work right now in the Carnegie Museum, by the way, in, in Pittsburgh. Um, we have some, uh, Alex, do you wanna ask a question? Otherwise, we just got a question in the chat. Yeah, I also, I mean, I have plenty of questions, as I mentioned, but I wanna ask the question that is in the chat currently for Anne. And um, this question, first, thank you both for this talk. these talks. Is there any idea about the context? What um, was the papyrus read in antiquity? Is there any way? to know who the audience might have been and uh, where there are both male and female priestesses of Hathor who may have read the papyrus. So this is a lot of questions, Anne, but um, maybe we can go through them. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by reading the papyrus as opposed to looking at the pictures, which I think is part of it. The, the texts are basically conversations of, or, or statements of the woman um, and they're a little, um, I don't, they're, they're all rather arcane and I'm not sure the interpretations um, are right. They, the, the translators translate them and um, talk about, you know, what they, what they think what they're saying means. And um, some of them are convincing, some of them are less so in my book. Um, but who would have read the texts? I'm not sure they would probably have been read aloud because most reading was not silent in those days. Um, if there was some sort of performative reading, that was um, one of the theories with it was that uh, this was a performative, I think um, uh, Fisher, Alfred and uh, Bravonsky um, argued, who are the translators, argued that the uh, reading of the text, that the text was read as a, um, sort of story during the Hathor festivals, but they read them as a kind of uh, cautionary tale about how dangerous it is to have too much sex when you go to the whorehouse. Um, so again, they're presuming that there is a prostitute, there are prostitutes and that that what is what this is all about. And that's why they were so puzzled by the apparently elevated status of the language and the fact that the woman seemed to be running things. Uh, whereas if you assume that the woman is Hathor, it makes perfect sense. Um, but who would have read it, um, I think is sort of beyond our knowing. I suspect that the intended audience was really Hathor. And it was it was done in such a way that she would read it and she would take pleasure in it because if you take it as a votive offering, that's what you would expect. Um, I don't know whether that answers the question properly or not, but. Yeah, Glynn is, Glynn is nodding. So I think okay, uh, we answered the question correct. Yes, um, Jen, do you want to? Do you have another question from the chat, or do we? Do if you have any questions, everyone, you can raise your hand. Also on the lower part of your screen, because we are a small group. I mean, relatively, we have a few minutes left. So please, um, just um, raise your hand also in the chat box so we can respond to your questions. If not, I have a question actually for N too. So um, about the display, also the modern display of the papyrus. What um, were there ever also concerns of in Turin also in the museum um, that uh, they would not want to show um, these sites um, for a museum audience? Um, I think there used to be. I actually wrote the department before I visited to Turin. I took those pictures myself, um, along with lots of other ones. And um, it was quite, they said, no, no, it's on display. And I was a bit taken aback. I'd assumed I'd need special permission or something to get behind the scenes. Uh, but it is, it's mounted on a wall at basically adult head height. And um, due to the treatment over the years, it's actually quite dark. 
Um, so it looks like this sort of dark, broken papyrus on the wall, and there's absolutely nobody looking at it at all. And of course, I go up with my camera and going click, 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 and there were like all sorts of people gathering around and think, you know, I heard, oh my God, in several languages. <laughs> Because it's it really is very dark, and in fact, this, the pictures I showed you, I took them um, with my iPhone actually, and they are um, they are quite dark. And what you have to do is adjust them. You have to play with them a bit, um, but it's very easy, as you can see. Uh, they're they're quite visible. The fragments. The real problem, of course, is that it's very fragmentary. And when you get into Jennifer's half, the animal half, it gets even worse. Um, but you can you can pull the traces out pretty clearly. Um, using most modern digital photo tools. Um, but I think, you know, unless somebody's taking four-year-olds and holding them up to the pictures, um, you know, or 10-year-olds or whatever, I don't think they could see them because they're really under the head level. Um, of course, that means that very short adults can't see them either, but into each life of some rain must fall. I, I remember I remember seeing it uh, when it was on, I was amazed that it was brought to the Louvre, actually. They had an exhibit there in um, 2012, 2013. Um, well, they're French, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it's true. But it was also very, I mean, I was just surprised that they they brought a papyrus because it's so, and that one, especially because it's yeah. so delicate. Um, but yeah, they left it, it was still pretty high up on the wall. And, and yes, it is a very hard, like a, a dark, papyrus to see. Um, so um, there are more questions in the chat. Glynis um, asked a question, but it seems that Magellan also answered in the chat about the female scribes. Um, so Magellan was talking about female scribes in, in the Near East. Um, I don't know how do, do Anna, maybe do you, could you speak about the presence of female scribes in Egypt? Um, I don't really it's a know. It's complicated. I mean, um, yeah. Many people deny it entirely. No women could read and write, and the fact that you have, you know, if you have a scribal palette with a woman's name on it, it must have been used for watercolor painting, I believe, um, was was the uh, description. Um, there are women who are called scribes, and uh, the interpretation of that is that they were used. They they were talking about the fact that they could draw, eye paint. They were cosmeticians and. Um, I've always been a little dubious that Hatshepsut could run the country without reading and writing. And there are some texts from Daryl Medina, uh, one of which has a little girl who is learning to read and write, which I found pretty definitive. And if you're teaching small, small children and are small girls in an artist colony to read and write along with their brothers, I suspect there were probably a lot of, of women who could read and write uh, in the general population, probably not women who worked out in the field or anything, they wouldn't really need it. Um, but sort of uh, upper classes, upper class women and women in even a, a sort of high class craftsman like the, the royal craftsman that worked in Daryl Medina. Um, I'm, I think it's fairly likely that they can read and write. There are also letters exchanged back and forth between the men and their wives. And they always talk about the fact that, you know, it must have been the village scribe who, who wrote the letters. But you know, would you really call in a professional scribe to send a note to your husband who's working up on the hill? And you know, it, some of these things were personal, so I can't imagine that they would have actually had someone else writing them. It just seemed, it, it seems like everybody's bending over backwards to say there was no writing. Women couldn't write in ancient Egypt. Um, there isn't any really good evidence for it, except for this one little text from Daryl Medina with the student. Um, but I think uh, it, it doesn't really do well to sort of go to great lengths to to argue against it because um, at least you know in different levels that's the other thing is there are different levels of literacy and um, they could probably read enough for whatever they needed thank you and um, oh jen um so we have a lot of uh, comments or, or questions also in the chat so sonia is referring to love songs also that were written by a woman um across the um region um, we have a question from uh, Elaine, actually, and super interesting. You mentioned the translation or a new translation of the Turin Papyrus. Could you tell us who published this, this new translation? So um, Elaine wants to read this. Maybe we can put it in the chat um, box also. Um, it's by Bravansky and Fisher Elford. Um, and it's not that new. It's in the 2000s, early 2000s, I think. 
Um, I can look it up, which I will do right now. Uh, let's see. Oh, I know where I can do this. Um, I can find it fairly. Marjolin, I have a question um, in the meantime for you also. What would you like to see? Um, now, you mentioned in the museum this fantastic project also that um, I, I think all of us um, love to to be seen more also. Um, what else should we do now really uh, to move into another direction uh, in the field? Do you have more comments of what should be done, Marjolin, so um, that the languages and yeah, that, that things are changing really. What do you wish? Um, yeah, I mean, I wish for there to be, I wish that, you know, that adequate number of staff and staff with expertise would be hired and kept on at institutions to take care of collections, to keep reviewing um, language because it changes. And, you know, the decisions I actually made at maybe the Morgan a year ago, maybe I would make slightly different ones now. So it's important to keep up with it. Um, and, you know, and for example, I recommended a phase two before, before I left for my fellowship, because there are some erotic scenes, for example, that we have on cylinder seals um, that are in the seal impression study collection that there's nothing technically wrong with the words. There's nothing, you know, outrageous there. But when you put everything together, it's kind of like the man is having sex with the woman and she's not really a part of it. And she's just sort of there. She's just the object. She's not, she's not present. And so that's why it, it needs, I mean, it took me months to do what I had done. And that was very, uh, like a very small portion of, of, you know, a collection or, you know, a catalog. So there's that. And there's also things around making information accessible and being transparent um, around provenance and how things are, how things got here. Um, and also transparency of information for students. I mean, sometimes it's hard to access information and information is in different languages. And that all has a bearing on who you, who gets into these programs, who then gets opportunities, and who keeps, who is able to keep going in this field. Um, so I hope that answers your question, and I hope I didn't take too long. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, there's just another question in the chat for you, and um, Glynis was wondering, uh, and what are the best sources for the female scribes that you mentioned or discussion about fe women? Discussion about literate. them? I don't know if there's a God. discussion either. I mean, I know that Lynn Mescal talks a little bit about, I think uh -huh. it's Lynn Mescal talks yeah. a little bit about literacy amongst women, but specifically in Daryl Medina. But yeah, I think a, a lot of the, the negative, the arguments that women couldn't read and write uh, were John Baines because um, he talked a lot about literacy general and he tends to take, I mean, he takes a very skeptical minimalist view of it. And that's perhaps a good, a good discipline to start with um, because of course we tend to assume that everybody could read and write because we can. So um, it's, hard to, it's hard to realize how much illiteracy there probably actually was in the ancient world. Um, so I think it's a, a salutary position, but I do think uh, that sort of completely excluding women from it is, is bending over backwards. Um, a lot of people have pointed things out, and I think Sonia pointed out in the chat that there, was, there are uh, love songs that uh, may have been written by women. And again, this, the party line about that is that um, that's why I actually said most of the literature and so forth. The party line about that is that the men wrote them and put them in the mouths of women, um, you know, because they were basically singers at parties and you have this, these things going back and forth and that could, doesn't say anything at all about who wrote the songs. There is one particular love poem that was always a favor of mine. Well, I wouldn't even actually call it a love poem, but I suspect was written by a woman just from the contents, 
which is about a woman looking up the kilt of a man as he bends over to get water from the fe- from the canal for the festival. And um, it ends with the phrase, it's longer than it is wide. <laughs> and that just doesn't sound like the sort of thing a guy would put in the mouths of a woman, you know, insufficiently romantic. And <laughs> On the other hand, maybe the ancient Egyptian women would be thought to be thinking that way by men. So who knows? I may be making assumptions here um, in in the way people thought. But my point is basically that we really don't know about gender and we assume we know about gender really hard. We assume it in a very firm way and we should sort of back off a little and see what the texts and the scenes and the love songs are actually telling us. And, uh, Sonia put in the chat a, a, a really excellent um, book, by the way, um, that talks about these poems that were written by women and um, songwriters. It's called Sex and the Golden uh, Ones, so Ancient Egyptian Love Songs in Context. And so this was um, written by Renata Lamgrovhova and uh, Hanna Navratilova. And um, yeah, really great also for if you're interested in learning about Hathor and all these songs written for Hathor and the cult of Hathor. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's it's three it's three fifty three. Um, so we should probably wrap up unless anyone has any last minute questions. Um, if not, I want to thank our speakers again. I'd like to thank um, my colleague Alex Nagel for um, helping me set up uh, this talk as well and. And yes, I hope you all join us for the next event that we have, which will hopefully be in September. We're hoping to do something fun for uh, New York Fashion Week, actually, and possibly maybe an in-person event. So that will be exciting Um, and it will be recorded. So even if you're not here in New York City, you can participate from far away. All right, thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye, thanks. Thank you, everyone.